John West. He was born in Aberdeen, Mississippi. I know that they're very proud to know that he was born there. And they're very proud also that he uh, moved from there. <laughs> and we're very proud that he married Sonia and moved here. We're also very proud of uh, John, you know, he's preached uh, many different places, Mississippi, Alabama, of course, Texas, and various other places, so he's been around. He's a graduate of Memphis School of Preaching and Faulkner University. University. What he tries to do is, for those who have trans transgressed God's law, is to preach them in such a way as they will repent of that transgression. Now, if you've transgressed man's law, he'll arrest you and put you in jail. <laughs> and then give you time to repent. He now preaches, uh, in addition to, well, in addition to being a deputy sheriff of Montgomery County, he also preaches for the Dayton Church of Christ. And so, John, I forgot what you're preaching on. <laughs> Whatever it is, uh, I know you'll do a good job. <laughs> If not, then I know Sonia will get that corrected. <laughs> we're, we're very, we're very pleased to have have uh, 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 no, John. And I, you know, well, actually, Sonia. We're glad to have Sonia. So John, come preach to us. Yeah, I, I, I just saw say that John is a life support system for church secretary. <laughs> so appreciate it. I'm going to, have to start paying somebody to come up and give an introduction, I think. <laughs> I don't think it'd change if I paid him. <laughs> Pay somebody to do it the way I'd want it done. <laughs> Buddy, I was already trying to figure out what you were going to say if you introduced me, and I had no idea it was Ken, and when I saw him, I could only imagine. <laughs> It is good to be here tonight, and I do appreciate your attendance, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak here on the lecture program once again. We will be discussing tonight the subject of the Christian church. What is the independent Christian church? Uh, Michael Hatcher will be dealing with the Disciples of Christ on Sunday, and I saw his manuscript, and I looked at my manuscript before they all went in the book. That's one advantage of having my wife as a secretary, and I can take peeks at things, and I said, I want to see what he, he did in his manuscript, see how close it was to mine. Well, I haven't talked to Michael since I finished my manuscript, but he walked in the door this evening. He said, uh, you're going to preach the first half of mine tonight, aren't you? I said, yep. <laughs> That's the good thing about going first. <laughs> he said, but that will open the floor up for him to deal with other aspects of what he has in his manuscript, and he won't have to go back and cover that. I imagine he'll touch on some of it. I don't know that I'll cover all of that tonight. But we do know that back about 200 years ago, there started to be changes within the United States when it came to religion and the way men were viewing religion. The Restoration Movement in America had its beginning toward the end of the 18th century. And from that grew a great movement. It grew with men who wanted to go back to the Bible leave the shackles of denominationalism, the creeds and the philosophies of man, to go simply to what the New Testament taught and the New Testament only. Denominations were so splintered with the creeds and with the human traditions that men started seeing their errors and seeing their problems. They started studying the Bible for themselves and determining to go back to the Bible without the additions of creeds or man-made traditions and philosophies. We have men like James O'Kelly, who had been part of the Methodist Episcopal Church, decided based on their doctrines he could no longer adhere to their teaching, and he left it. He and some other people united together, and they formed in 1793 the Republican Methodist. Not even being satisfied with that through the course of the next several years, in 1801 they changed their name to the Christian Church. They thought that would adhere at least closer to what had been done in the past in denominationalism. We find that change was uh, made in 1801. 
And they said that their goal was to go back to the Bible and to take the Bible itself as their only creed and to leave the creeds of man. And thus they did that. About the same time, there were other men around the United States and other areas of the country who started in their study for themselves realizing that denominationalism was not the plan of God. They realized that what was being taught in these various religions were not from the New Testament of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And men like Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, Barton W. Stone, Raccoon John Smith, and many, many others started seeing the changes that need to be made from their own personal study of God's Word. And thus, through their preaching, they found one another and determined to unite based on the Bible itself and the Bible alone. The unity that these men sought, however, was short-lived. When you start studying the, the restoration movement, the things that were going on, now these men were not totally back to the teaching of the New Testament. There were still issues and still problems within their own lives and their own way of thinking. However, they were getting closer and closer as each year passed. But as the years passed, some apparently must have missed their denominational ties and they wanted to go back to some of them. And what we're going to study tonight in this lesson about the Christian church and how that through the course of the 1800s into the early 1900s, changes were made. And these changes were not for the better, but for the worse. The unity that these men sought were short-lived with the creation of the Missionary Society and the introduction of the instrument into worship. Some of these had already left the, the denominational idea of the instrument and other aspects that they were following. And yet because of that tug in their own heart of wanting to do something that pleased them or that sounded good, they went right back into what they had left. Thus once again splintering the thing that they were trying to unite. Tonight I want to notice some things and we're going to key in on three different points as you can see in the manuscript as well. We're going to look at three points that uh, shows the problem with the independent Christian church. David, in talking just a few minutes ago about the New Testament church, showed the teaching of the Bible and what constitutes the New Testament church. And you can go back into your New Testament and you can look at what the New Testament teaches and follow that, as he mentioned, the blueprint or the pattern and restore the church of the New Testament as was established by Jesus Christ and preached by the apostles, founded on the day of Pentecost, about A.D. 33. And we're going to look at these counterfeit churches and how they're not measuring up. They are just as was said earlier, counterfeit. They're not the genuine article. They're not even close. And even those who claim to be close are not as close as they think they are. The first thing we see with the independent Christian church is the name. Well, some people say, well, what's the problem with the name? Well, if you'll get on your internet, and I know most of us, if not all of us here, have the internet, you can do some searches. I did searches on the internet when I was preparing this manuscript, and I looked at various Christian churches around the United States. Some of them maintain the name Church of Christ. But we're going to find out that they're nowhere closely tied to the teaching of the New Testament. Oh, they may have some points that are exactly the way we teach or similar to what we teach and what the New Testament teaches, but they're far off in many, many others. There are many areas in the church that are in the country where the independent Christian church calls themselves the independent Christian church. There are some places where they call themselves the Church of Christ. And yet they are by no stretch of, the, of any imagination the true Church of Christ. For instance, the Colonial Heights Church of Christ in Norfolk, Virginia states on their website the following, and I'm quoting, The Colonial Heights Church of Christ is an independent Christian church. We are non-denominational, there is no overseeing structure, body, or organization outside of our local congregation. We are, however, loosely affiliated through common beliefs and practices with other independent Christian churches in what is sometimes referred to as our, quote, brotherhood. Now that is a direct quote from their website. They call themselves the Colonial Heights Church of Christ, but they identify themselves not as a church of Christ, they identify themselves as an independent Christian church. Why would you call yourself one thing and identify yourself 
as someone else. That's one thing that, that in law enforcement, and I haven't been in it that long, but in getting into it and finding there are laws in the state of Texas that uh, prohibit people from giving a false identity. They may appear to be one thing. I may have a physical description of a person, let's say a person had robbed a store, and I've given a physical description of the clothing they're wearing, their height, their approximate weight, and descriptions of their body, facial hair or whatever. I come upon a person that, admits, that uh, matches that exact description, and I'm told that he has been handled before either in our agency or other agencies. He's had an arrest record, and we know his name. And I ask him to identify himself, and he gives me a false identity. He's doing that to stay out of trouble. He knows he's going to jail if he gives the correct identity. But upon finding out he's given a false identity, I can arrest him for that. Why would a person want to alter their identity or give someone a different identity rather than who they really are? It's often because they're not wanting to be honest. Why would someone in religion want to wear a certain name and then identify themselves with a totally different group? Well, they'll have to answer that question. I will say, very best, it's dishonest. It's deceitful. Yet they'll maintain that they are the church of Christ while identifying as the independent Christian church. And we are loosely affiliated, they say, with the common beliefs and practices with other independent Christian churches. Then change your name to the Colonial Heights Independent Christian Church. Take the church of Christ off of your sign and off of all of your letterhead because you're not that. They are an independent Christian church. They should identify themselves as such. But after searching other websites, I found some who identified themselves as the independent Christian church, as Church of Christ Instrumental, or simply Churches of Christ. But I've got a question. Where in the New Testament does it teach that the church was called the Church of Christ Inter uh, Instrumental? Or where does it teach in the New Testament that the church is identified as an independent Christian church? Can we find those terms anywhere in the pages of God's Word in the New Testament? No, we cannot. Then why do they use those terms? Why do they continue to hold on to those terms? Because it sets them apart with their particular belief. If they're going to be the true church of Christ, founded on Pentecost, that is taught spoken about all throughout the New Testament, then adhere to the doctrine. If you're not going to adhere to the doctrine, change your name to what you really are. They're nothing but a denomination. They call themselves a non-denominational congregation. But based on their own website and based on their own teaching, they are in fact a denomination. While the New Testament does not specifically state a name, David mentioned this in his lesson just a few minutes ago. The church is referred to in various terms. Acts 2.47, for instance, it's referred to simply as the church. Romans 16.16, 16, the churches of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, the body of Christ. We could go on and on. 1 Timothy 3.15 tells us it's the house of God. These are descriptors of the church. Tells us about the church. But find any other term in the New Testament that's being used today by various denominations and then talk to them about it. Well, you won't find it. And they know you won't find it. So some adhere to closely tied names to the Bible. Others just really don't care. And you'll see that uh, as we get through this lectureship and you'll hear other speakers and their various topics dealing with these counterfeit churches. Well, why would the independent Christian church want to do what they're doing today or maintain the certain titles on the front of their building they do, particularly when they do put churches of Christ, when they're not adhering to the Bible teaching of what the true church of Christ really is. Since the Bible does teach us that we're to speak as oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11, then we should so speak in the designation of the church. And that's not being done in many places. Another example is the Public Fork Christian Church. Now, this is not necessarily tied in as much to their name, but in their practice. But it does give you an indication of their name. They do not even hint 
or pretend to call themselves a church of Christ. They tell you they are a Christian church. But here's what the website says. Most Christian churches today, folks, will still say they're non-denominational. And they apparently don't even understand what that means based on what they're doing. But here's what this website tells us for the public Fort Christian church. As a non-denominational church, we seek to unite people from all kinds of denominational backgrounds. And that is on the tab, our beliefs. And that's among other beliefs that they have. But a non-denominational church seeking to unite all kinds of denominational people from different backgrounds. How could one claim to be non-denominational and then want to unite with denominations? They're no different than the Colonial Heights so-called Church of Christ. They're hypocrites. It is a height of hypocrisy to do what they're doing. Maintaining non-denominationalism while fellowshipping denominations. Why not just tell everybody, we're a denomination, we admit it, and we're proud of it. And we're going to unite with all these other denominations around. If you don't like it, you don't have to be here. That's what they should say. Because that's what they're doing in practice. But they're like a lot of our politicians. They want to soft soap it enough to make not only their members, but other members that are loosely affiliated with them feel good about themselves by calling themselves non-denominational churches while adhering to denominational practices. And that's been the problem that's taken place with the Christian church since the mid to late 1800s. And it hasn't changed, folks. And it's not going to change until they repent, until they lose not only their name, but their practices as well. The true church of Christ is not a denomination, has never been a denomination, and as long as we follow the teaching of the New Testament, we'll never be a denomination. The New Testament knew of no denominations. And yet, we're seeing them on every corner today. It's hard to find a, even a corner of a roadway that doesn't have some type of denomination on it. All I'm holding on are the man-made names. The independent Christian church has done the same thing. When Christ and his apostles preach unity, they preach it from the standpoint of what we do is based on the word of God, not acceptance of other beliefs like the uh, public Fort Christian church was doing and continues to do and a lot of other independent Christian churches do. It wasn't based on, I want to accept you because you seem like a pretty good person. And if you want to do pretty good in your life, we'll accept you in. You know, we don't have to agree. Just do what you want to do, for the most part, and we can continue to agree. That's the attitude that people in religion have today, is all tolerance and acceptance. We see it in politics, we see it in religion, and it's only getting worse. Because we're to the point now we want to tolerate everybody so much that we'll let anybody believe whatever they want and say, Oh, good brother, you're going to heaven with me. And have no clue in what the New Testament teaches. In John chapter 17... Beginning in verse 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also might be sanctified through the truth. Now notice verses 20 and 21. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I and thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Through what word? The word the apostles were preaching. The word of God. And unity was based on that very teaching. Can you imagine John the baptizer during his day as he was preaching preparing the way of Christ, saying the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He's going to establish His kingdom. But now if you want to remain a Jew, or if you want to remain this, or, He'll accept you anyway. Can you read that anywhere in the Bible from John's preaching? What about the apostles? What did the apostles preach when they encountered people who opposed them? Oh, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. We're just preaching this because this is what we particularly believe. But if you don't believe that, that's okay. 
If that was the case, they wouldn't have been treated the way they were. They wouldn't have been taken before the Sanhedrin. They wouldn't have been beaten with many stripes. They wouldn't have been put to death for their preaching. They could have pacified everyone and made everyone feel good about themselves. Converted one or two here and there and told the rest of them just to stay how they were that God would accept them anyway. Yet that's what we hear today, not only in every other denomination, but also in the Christian church denomination. It's no different. How can you accept people in when there is a total opposition to what the Bible teaches? We see that even in the church today with our apostate liberals. Is that what Paul preached in 1 Corinthians 1.10? When he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Paul preached unity. But he preached unity based upon the Word of God and trying to cause the Corinthians to see that they were causing division within the church there with all the many problems they had that he dealt with in that first letter. But we also see that he was trying to preach unity. But that unity had to be based on the clear teaching of the New Testament. Though they didn't have it written down, it was being preached to them. And we understand it as we have it written down that that's what Paul was doing. We also understand that that's what Paul expects of us today. And men are not doing that. Secondly, we see another problem with the Christian church, and that is the Missionary Society. In the 1840s, the Restoration Movement in America began having problems. The Missionary Society was one of those major problems that broke unity and that continues to keep us from having unity today. Now, it goes further than that today, but this is one of the main issues they were dealing with at that time. These problems would escalate to a point that it caused damage to the church that could not be repaired. And that's why we have the Christian church denomination today. The churches of Christ remain true to the teaching of the New Testament while the Christian church would earn apostasy. But the beginning of the missionary society caused division that these men in years past had sought to restore. They wanted unity but here was something bringing about division. And there were those who were pushing for it because it was popular. They thought people liked it. And so they continued to teach it, write about it. We're going to talk about that in a minute. One of the main influences in this particular area. And how it continued to grow. But folks, just because the thing's popular doesn't make it right. And this may have been gaining in popularity among some people. It did not make it right, and it does not make it right today. The official establishment of the American Missionary Society was in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1849. Alexander Campbell, though prior to this, had paved the way by pushing for it. Campbell, in his frequent essays on church organization between 1842 and 1848, helped produce the, er the efforts to organize and establish the American Christian Missionary Society. Campbell was one of those that thought he had the majority of the brotherhood behind him. He thought because it was gaining in popularity, it was an idea that ought to be pushed. Campbell sought to streamline the organization of the church, really. He thought that he could produce a more efficient and scriptural organization. The problem was it was neither efficient nor scriptural. And Campbell didn't see that. He failed to realize that it was unscriptural to the very core. Find the teaching of the New Testament that shows us to have an organization the way they set the missionary society up. You won't find it, folks. It wasn't in there in the Bible then. It's not in it today. And it's not something that we, must, we could do today, even though... They still follow that. But this was uh, originated with the thinking of certain brethren. And Campbell was one of those leading men who pushed for it. On October the 23rd, 1849, the first convention met and the Missionary Society was organized. Alexander Campbell, in absence due to sickness, 
was appointed first president of the Missionary Society. There were also four vice presidents and a secretary chosen at that convention. They wrote 13 articles for uh, that particular organization on their beliefs and their practices. We're not going to go over all of them. I don't have all of them listed in the manuscript. If you'll notice in the book, you'll see some of them listed, listed some of the key ones. But if you'll notice in that, these are the articles that they used to form this parachurch organization. And that's all it was. That's all it continues to be. Sadly, folks, we've got people in the church today that are doing the same thing. They're doing it under a different name than the Missionary Society. But they're doing the same practice or following the same practice that these people followed back in the 1840s and 1850s. But from the very beginning, there were objections made. No matter how hard Campbell pushed it, there were those that objected. Brethren could see that this was unscriptural and did not need to be followed. I want to give you three objections that were listed when the, the whole idea first arose. First of all, it was said that since delegates, membership, and officers were all limited to those who paid set fees, the society was built on a money basis and was wrong. If you wanted to get in the missionary society, you paid your fee to get in. What about those folks during that time that didn't have money? They just couldn't get in. They were out of luck. Sorry. So sad, too bad. You just can't get in. Give some money, we'll let you in. Give enough money, you might be an officer. You see the political aspect of something like this. But not only the political, the unscriptural aspect. Can you find anywhere in your New Testament where it teaches that if you want to, get, uh, to become part of the church or part of some organization in the church, that you pay your set fee and we'll let you in? It's ridiculous. But that was one of the things they were doing, and this was one of the main objections used. Secondly, it was argued that God's word, quote, knows nothing of a confederation of churches and an ecclesiastical system culminating in an earthly head for government or for any other purpose. Those objecting saw it right. This is a wrong organization with an earthly head, an earthly form of organization, and earthly government doing spiritual work. You pay us the money, we'll do the work for you. That's not taught anywhere in the pages of God's Word either. The third objection was, it was a dangerous precedent, a departure from the principles for which we have always contended. These men that were trying to restore the New Testament were fighting against these man-made interventions, yet you have Campbell, one that was trying to come out of denominationalism, bringing back denominational ideas. And it gained the popularity enough that they formed the organization and continued to push for it for many years. Well, in 1855, Talbert Fanning and William Lipscomb established the Gospel Advocate for the purpose of answering the sinfulness of the Missionary Society. In May of 1857, Talbert Fanning wrote this. He said, We believe and teach that the Church of Christ is fully competent to most profitably employ all our powers, physical, intellectual, and spiritual, that she is the only divinely authorized missionary, Bible, Sunday school, temperance, and cooperation society on earth. It is, has been, and we suppose always will be our honest conviction that the true and genuine service of God can be properly performed only in and through the church. Amen. Exactly right. The church does the work. The work of the church... Part of that is evangelism. The missionary society was wanting to take that to their own separate parachurch organization and them send the missionaries out rather than the church sending missionaries out. That was one of the flaws in it. One of the main flaws in it. And Fanning wrote this to let people know. But Fanning goes on. He says, Hence we have questioned the propriety of brethren's effort to work most successfully by means of state, district, and county organizations missionary, publication, Bible societies, or Bible unions, temperance societies, Freemasons and Oddfellow societies to, quote, visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction or any other human organization for the accomplishing the legitimate labor of the church. It's the work of the church to do that, not the missionary society. And that was a major flaw that Campbell had during that time in pushing for the organization of it. Well, the third thing, and we're running out of time, 
that continues to cause separation and division in the church is that of the instrument. And that is another major flaw of the independent Christian church. This was the next assault on the church during that period of time, 1850s, was when the instrument was, was introduced into worship. The issue first arose at least to Campbell around 1851. Now it's interesting, we've been talking about Campbell being on the wrong side of the fence on the Missionary Society. He comes down on the right side of the fence on this. And it's amazing he could see the problem with the instrument, but he couldn't see the problem with the Missionary Society. But in 1851, he was asked to make a statement about the introduction of the instrument in worship. And Campbell wrote a short essay in the Millennial Harbinger showing his opposition to the instrument. And he said this, But I presume to all, and this is just a partial quote, it is a long quote he had, but he said, I presume to all spiritually minded Christians that such age would be as a cowbell in a concert. And he was right on that. Exactly right. In 1860, it was at Midway, Kentucky, where the instrument was first introduced. L.L. Pinkerton was the local preacher of that congregation. And he saw no problem using the instrument. As a matter of fact, he became a staunch proponent of it and defender of it. Those at Midway tried to defend the introduction of the instrument by arguing that it helped their deplorable singing. Here's what was said. Now this was from Earl West's book, In Search of the Ancient Order. Brother West said this, The singing had de degenerated to, into screeching and brawling. That would, as Pinkerton said, <laughs> scare the rats from worship. <laughs> well, I've heard some singing like that before. But we'll talk about that later. At first, it was suggested a meeting be held on Saturday night to practice the songs. Nothing wrong with that. Shortly afterwards, someone brought in a melodeon to be used in getting the right pitch. All they want to do was hit a key to get the right pitch. Before long, one of the sisters was accompanying the singing with her playing on the melodeon. The group observed that the effort of the use of the melodeon was good on the singing. And so it was decided to use the instrument on the Lord's Day worship. And the day it was introduced, Pinkerton stood up and defended it and said that he saw nothing wrong with using the instrument in worship as an aid to help their singing. But folks, poor singing is never an argument for violating God's word. Poor singing doesn't give a person the right to do what they please. Remember back in the Old Testament, we see more than one scripture that says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that's what they did at Midway, Kentucky in 1860. They did that which was right in their own eyes. I can understand they had concerns about their singing, but they were starting to make amends of that. Not that the Bible says you've got to have the perfect pitch and the perfect tone on everything you sing. It says sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. But I also understand people want to do the very best they can. And they were starting in the right path to try to practice their singing, to learn it, to get better for their worship. But they made the mistake when they brought the little melodian in. And the sister sat down and decided she would start playing because it helped them learn that tune. And it escalated from there. And from the house on Saturday night, it made its way to the Lord's church on Sunday morning. And they violated God's word when they did it. And that little melodian brought about, brought about the irreparable damage caused to the unity of the body of Christ. Those today who use the instrument in worship simply argue that the New Testament doesn't condemn it. Now, I've heard people make that argument, well, the Bible doesn't condemn it, so if the Bible doesn't condemn it, I can do it. Folks, I imagine we could sit down, this group of people here, and we could come up with a list of things that the Bible does not specifically condemn and say, okay, now when are you going to start doing this? When are you going to start doing that? Oh, th there would be objections to some of the things we might bring up. The Bible does not specifically say this, therefore you can do it, can't you? And you'd have people object. Oh, no, 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 you couldn't do that. that. That wouldn't be right. Some of these same people will argue that since the instrument is not specifically, in their words, condemned in the New Testament, it is authorized. Well, there's a problem with that line of thinking. We're going to talk about that just in a moment before we close. But I want to go back to the Colonial House Church of Christ. Since we've quoted them before, let's look at them once again. 
In reference to the instrument, here's what they said. We make use of instrumental music in our public worship services contrary to the practices of the Churches of Christ non-instrumental. We believe that worship using instruments has biblical precedence in the Old Testament and that instruments, while not specifically mentioned in the New Testament, are nowhere forbidden or condemned in Scripture. Well, I'll contend that they are forbidden and condemned in the New Testament based on the law of exclusion based on specific statements in the Bible on what we must do. And yet they're saying, well, the Bible does not condemn it, therefore I can use it. That's been the argument of the Christian church for the last 150 years. And even though it's not a very good argument, it's like that song I heard years ago, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And I guess they're going to stick to it, even with all its fallacies. First, in reference to this quote, we're not under the Old Testament anymore. I don't care what precedents they think they can find in the Old Testament. We're not under the Old Testament. And they know that. But they've got to use something to try to uh, make themselves feel good about what they're doing. Secondly, there is no authorization in the New Testament. Whether they can find specific condemnation, what they really need to do is look at the authorization. The Bible authorizes singing. Nowhere does the Bible authorize the mechanical instrument. By the way, when I say the instrument, folks, I'm referring to the mechanical instrument because we all use instruments. It's our mouth, our voice. That's an instrument, but it's not a mechanical instrument that we bring in. There are numerous arguments that you've heard for years that we could go over. And again, for the sake of time, we don't have time for it. But simply look at your New Testament and understand and see what the Bible teaches about music in worship. Yes, we have music. Dub led us in music, but it was with the voice. We sang as the Bible authorizes and commands us to do. Ephesians 5.19 tells us, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. I know the solo argument. I know what they've they use on that. I've heard it. I've studied it. I've read the debate books where they've used it. But look at the plain teaching of that verse. Singing and making melody. If you stop right there, you might want to argue with the singing is the voice, the making melody is the piano. But it describes it. Look at the next three words. In your heart. Find on a keyboard somewhere in that passage. Find uh, on the strings, the drums, or whatever else. It doesn't say it. It says, sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. There's our authorization for singing. And that's the only authorization we have. It doesn't say, sing and play the piano to the Lord. It doesn't say, sing and strum on your guitar to the Lord. It doesn't say, sing and beat on your drums to the Lord. It says, sing and make melody in your hearts to the Lord. That's plain, isn't it? It's simple enough that we understand it, that we don't have a, a stage with a band on it, piano, drums, guitars, or whatever else might be used, because we understand the teaching of the New Testament. The Christian church, just simply the independent Christian church, tells you, well, it doesn't condemn it, so we're going to use it. Folks, that's some very flawed reasoning, scary reasoning, too. If you reason that way on that one, uh, one topic, just think what could be argued and try to be defended. Not successfully, but they can try in other areas. The instrument was that final divider in the quest for unity in the Restoration Movement. Did the Restoration Movement end? No, it didn't. It did not end. But there was a change. There was a split. And the Independent Christian Church, as well as later the Disciples, Use the instrument and continue to do so. They enjoyed the missionary society. And nowadays, if you read and you study more about the Christian church in general, you'll find more and more denominationalism in it than you do find any teaching of the New Testament. And while the independent Christian church claims to be non denominational in their pattern, they're not patterned after the Bible, folks. They're patterned after man-made modern denominationalism. And they're adhering to that very thing today. And they are in error 
and in sin as a result of it. They made themselves in the denomination when they left the plain teaching of the New Testament and changed the organization and the worship of the church. They made themselves that denomination. They can't accuse us of saying, well, we're not a denomination and you're just saying that. They have done it themselves by their own practices. And we must fight it and continue to hold firm on the Word of God. As we close this evening, it may be that you're here tonight as a child of God. Maybe you've sinned in some way and left the clear teaching of, of God's Word. Why not come back tonight and ask God to forgive you? Repent of your sins, confess them, and we'll pray for you. If you're here and you're not a member of the Lord's Church, if you were here this last hour when you heard David's lesson, you heard what that New Testament church is based on the teaching of God's Word. And if you're not, you need to obey the gospel. Through your faith in Jesus as a son of God, you can come repenting of your sins. Make the good confession that Jesus is the son of God. And with all your heart, if you believe that, you can confess that with a mouth. And upon the confession of your faith, we will immerse you in baptism, wash your sins away through the precious blood of Jesus, add you to his church, the New Testament church, not a counterfeit. As you strive to live a Christian life and do so faithfully, heaven will be your home one day. If there are those who need to respond in any way tonight, we urge you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing.